if a dismissive avoidant narcissist were prone to confess, this is what it would sound like. And before I proceed, no, there's no difference between male and female narcissists. This is an online canard propagated by self-styled experts and other online riffraff. <laughs> Narcissists, male and female, share the same etiology, the same psychodynamic, the same psychology, and display the same behaviors, which is why the language in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and in the International Classification of Diseases, the language is gender neutral. It's not political correctness. It's simply reality. So, if we were to catch us a dismissive avoidant Narcissist, a narcissist with a dismissive avoidant attachment style. What would she say to us? This is what she would say. I lure potential providers of at least two of the four S's. And to remind you, the four S's are sex, supply, sadistic or narcissistic, services, and safety, presence. So, <clears throat> the dismissive avoidant narcissist lures potential providers, baits them, there's a process of baiting. Okay, let's proceed. Confession of a dismissive avoidant narcissist. I lure potential providers of at least two of the four S's by parading, by displaying by exhibiting the wounded child or the victim and thus triggering their protective maternal reflexes as healers, saviors, rescuers and fixers and their sense of justice. So the dismissive avoidant narcissist presents a facade of a wounded, traumatized child in need of care, compassion, empathy, and above all, protection and help, or a victim with the very same list of needs. And this triggers in the potential providers, potential sources of supply, potential intimate partners, potential friends. It triggers in them maternal reflexes, protective reflexes, and all kinds of complexes, the dark side, a savior rescuer complex, a healer fixer complex, a messianic complex. There's also an issue of justice. When we are confronted with injustice, we wish to remedy and rectify the situation, and it becomes a bit compulsive. Okay, continue the confession of a dismissive avoidant narcissist. When the providers seek to introduce emotions and intimacy into the equation, I recoil aggressively, I push them away, I encourage them to leave me be, to leave me alone, and to satisfy these needs with other people. First of all, pay attention to the language, <laughs> providers. <laughs> it's very impersonal, very transactional, non-emotional, so providers, an equation, not relationship, but equation as if this were some kind of exercise in arithmetic or algebra. And then <clears throat> when the other party, when the potential source of supply or the intimate partner or the friend, or when they try to introduce love, other positive emotions, compassion, empathy, affection, intimacy into the relationship, this creates in the dismissive avoidant narcissist a recoil a recoil. And as she, as she says, I recoil aggressively. I push them away. I encourage them to leave me be and to satisfy their needs with other people. It's very interesting because it seems as if there's no possessiveness here. There's no jealousy. There's a, a, a distinct, prominent preference for profound aloneness 
It's a schizoid position. I want to be alone. Leave me alone. Let me be. Go away. Find someone else. Don't bother me. <laughs> kind of. Continue with the confession. If there is... So, sh what she does when the relationship devolves <laughs> into love and intimacy or even just affection or friendship, she is triggered. She's terrified. Or even, I would say, disgusted. It, she finds the whole situation repulsive. And she pushes her partners away towards other people. She encourages them to form relationships, alternative relationships, with others. And then she says, if the resulting liaison between her partner and someone else, if the resulting liaison is pl platonic, at least someone else now suffers the headache. It is a relief to have gotten rid of a demanding, nagging presence. That's how she sees her partner, or her friend, or her children. I continue to enjoy all the benefits, she says, two of the four S's. But at the same time, I pay no costs in terms of scarce resources, such as my time and attention. So the thinking is, a balance sheet kind of thinking, a kind of financial statement kind of thinking, bottom line. <clears throat> when her partners, her sources of supply, her friends become demanding, when they accept, expect reciprocity, when they introduce positive emotions such as love, or intimate, when they, when they um, create an intimate ambience or so intimate environment, the relationship becomes suffocating. There's an engulfment anxiety, sort of. And so then the dismissive, avoidant narcissist pushes the partner, pushes the source of supply, pushes the, the friend away towards someone else. And then there are two possibilities. The new relationship with someone else may be platonic, or it may involve sex. If it is platonic, great. Someone else has a problem now. <laughs> she doesn't need to cater to the needs of her. She's not required to cater to the needs of her intimate partner. She doesn't need to pay attention. She doesn't need to waste time. She doesn't need to be around. She doesn't need to support. She doesn't need to, to provide succor. She doesn't need to do anything, actually. She keeps receiving the two out of four S's, whichever two these may be. And at the same time, she pays, there's no cost. She pays nothing for these services, for these two S's, for the sex and services, for the services and safety, for the supply and safety, for the supply and services, whichever two S's. She doesn't pay anything for that. Someone else is paying the price, the new guy or the new, the new girl. Um, by pushing away uh, her intimate partner, or disintimate partner by pushing away her friends and by pushing away everyone basically everyone who has a claim on her everyone who has a claim on her time and resources and attention and and so on by pushing them away she's outsourcing the problem now there's someone else who has to listen to her partner talk to her partner pay attention to her partner spend time with her partner travel with her partner have sex with her partner. It's all great. <laughs> she, the, her partner has been taken off her hands. And now she's free. These people, the dismissive avoidance, are fiercely independent. Freedom is the number, number one value. They would sacrifice anything for freedom. And that's why they encourage their partners to, to, to be unfaithful. That's why many of them uh, suggest an open relationship open or an open marriage. That's why they become very disgruntled and irritated and annoyed when the partner won't go away, won't find someone else, won't develop an alternative relationship. As they perceive this as stubbornness or even passive aggression. I mean, I told you, you can, I told you that you can, you could have sex with others. I have no problem with that. I told you you could travel with your best friend of the opposite sex. I have no problem with that. Just leave me alone. 
Let me do my thing. I need my space. I need my time. So if the resulting alternative relationship is platonic, great. If it involves sex as well as love and intimacy, in other words, the dismissive avoidant narcissist pushes her partner away. And if then the partner finds someone else and has sex with them, that's great. That's even better because it affords her. And I'll read her own words. If it ends up involved, if this alternative relationship with someone else ends up involving sex as well as love and intimacy, it affords me the added benefit of being able to weaponize the guilt and shame of the strain provider in order to modify their behaviors and secure the long-term availability of two out of the four S's. Her writing is a bit convoluted, <laughs> even for my taste. But what she's saying is this. She starts a relationship. The relationship is transactional. It's founded on the provision of two out of the four S's, sex, supply, safety, services, and so on. Now, as long as a relationship is constructed on the exchange of goods and, goods and services, it flourishes, it thrives. She's delighted. But then if the other party catches feelings, catches emotions, and tries to move it a step further to evolve the relationship, to progress it into the terrain of intimacy and love that terrifies the dismissive anxious, uh, dismissive avoidant, I'm sorry, uh, narcissist. And then she pushes her partner away. Again, when I say partner, it could be intimate partner, could be child, could be spouse, could be girlfriend, could be boyfriend, could be just best friend, could be a colleague even. Anyhow, when someone tries to introduce closeness, togetherness, intimacy, love in romantic relationship, this absolutely suffocates and terrifies the dismissive avoidant narcissist and she pushes the person, that person away, the nagging demanding person away. She encourages that person to form relationships with other people so as to take care of their needs, cater to their needs. And so these relationships could be platonic or sexual in nature. And if they're sexual in nature, that's great because then she can blackmail her partner. So imagine an intimate relationship. She pushes her boyfriend away because he demands intimacy and love. And, I mean, that's not for her. She pushes her boyfriend away. He ends up having sex with another girl. That's great because now he feels guilty. Now he feels ashamed. And so she can modify his behavior, which is a gent gentle way of saying that she can extort him and blackmail him. And she can then secure the long-term availability of two out of the four S's. Now that he has strayed, now that he has betrayed her in his own mind, now that he has become unfaithful, now that there's been infidelity involved, she can blackmail him into staying in her life and continuing to provide the two out of four S's. Of course, she's not offering intimacy and love. She's not reclaiming her, her intimate partner. That's not what it's all about. She would continue to encourage an intimate, her intimate partner to have sex, love, and intimacy with other people. But now she can blackmail him because he feels uncomfortable with what he had done. And she ends by saying, I become possessive, jealous, only when the commitment of the providers is equivocal, when I cannot take the providers for granted because of their personality. They may be promiscuous, vengeful, defiant, dysregulated in your words, or maybe because they regard the transaction as lopsided and they're shopping for a better one. In all these situations, I become possessive and jealous. That's a snippet from the confession of and a dismissive avoidant narcissist in the wake of a video that I posted a few days ago. Fun person to be with. <laughs>